This episode of the AD History Podcast is brought to you by listeners like you, contributing through the crowdfunding platform Patreon. Learn more about how you can support the show by visiting patreon.com slash AD History Podcast and the exclusive benefits that await your generous support. Join us in the effort to keep creating the AD history you deserve by visiting patreon.com slash AD History Podcast. Thank you. Have you ever wondered what happened in the fallout of the Han Dynasty? Or if a beloved Japanese queen slash shamanist even existed? Well, have we got a story for you. This is the AD History Podcast. Weaving a tapestry of world history from 1 AD to HD. Powered by TGNR. Get your good news that's real news at TGNR by visiting tgnreview.com. Now here are your hosts... Paul K. DiCostanzo and Patrick Foote. And brought to you by London and New York City, you are listening to the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo and I am joined by my co host, Patrick Foote. Patrick, end of a season, end of a century. Are you pumped? I am really pumped. It's always quite exciting when we get to the end of a uh, century. It's just, it's amazing how fast we're going, Paul, through this. It felt like, it felt like only, it was, feels like years ago. I mean, technically it was kind of years ago, I suppose, when we first began this journey. But we're already at 200 um, AD. It, it, it's crazy stuff. Happy to be here. Happy, excited to be making this another big milestone in this podcast's journey. Yeah, there's no question about it. It's been a journey. It's been an evolution. You know, we've been learning as we have gone. The show has evolved subtly, but definitely over time. If you listen to this episode and compare it to episode one, you will (laughs) notice a very big difference between the two and see exactly what it is that we are talking about. And today, one of the coolest things about what we're doing, in fact, is that both of our subjects begin and end and take place in East Asia, which I think is awfully cool. In your case, you have top billing today with the Han Dynasty and everything that is happening there in China. And also, we get to visit a place we have not yet gone, but I think many of our listeners are very interested in. And that is our first foray into Japan. And before we get into it, lay down the ground rules and all that, something we want to remind our listeners of is that indeed the show comes out every other Saturday. So set your watch to it. Unless we tell you otherwise, you can expect it then. Because we still get questions of, oh, you know, when do you upload? You know, when does it become available? Every two weeks on Saturday. Unless, of course, you're a Patreon subscriber and contributor. In which case, you get it two days early on the Thursday. But now, with all of that out of the way... It is time for our necessary, obligatory, now legendary AD History Podcast Ground Rules. 1. Evaluate events in the context they occurred. 2. Over the span of recorded history, the way it was recorded, its methodology, and the facts that are important have changed immensely. How we view history today is not necessarily how we viewed it 50 years ago. 3. Nothing in history was inevitable. And 4. History and the past is like a different country. Mr. Foot, Sir Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you, Paul. So uh, we ended things on a bit of a cliffhanger last time, if memory serves me well. And that was with the Yellow Turban Rebellion. And we are carrying on this story now. And as we covered last time, the with the death of Emperor Ling, the Han Dynasty was in turmoil. And we know that this turmoil would lead eventually to the next big period of Chinese history, known as the Three Kingdoms period. And a lot of people will just tell you simply, the Han Dynasty ended and the Three Kingdoms began. But this change wasn't that simple and it definitely didn't happen overnight. And even by the end of the second century of AD, not one of these kingdoms had actually been formally established. For a few decades after the Yellow Turban Revolt, China stayed in a state of panic and turmoil. And let's talk about that brief period, when brief, a good few decades of a uh, period of time between the end of the Han Dynasty and the proper formation of the Three Kingdoms. And this all very much begins with Ling's death, the former emperor. And 
He is seen as the last true emperor of the Han dynasty. His death in 189 AD left a fractured China without a true ruler, and many wanted that spot. Ling died young, just in his early 30s. I believe it was health reasons. He wasn't murdered or poisoned as some other people might be. He just had health conditions that led him to dying young. And this meant his heir was a child. His son was a Liu Bain, who was also known as Shao. He took to the throne at just 13 years old. And many saw this child emperor as a way into controlling the land, which is something we've seen in China's past, Paul, that's for sure. Yeah, there's no question about it. So last time we had kind of a little talk about corruption. And one of the forms of this corruption, especially when you're talking about both, if you go back and you hear how this all happened with both the Western and Eastern Han dynasties, one of the ways power brokers behind the scenes would ultimately go about achieving that kind of influence and power and what would be considered corruption is by doing their level best to appoint these young, impressionable, and easily manipulated emperors. Because in that way, they had far, far less potential objection and issue and any potential problems that could have been created by a older, more experienced, wiser, and more self-assured ruler, one that just for all intents and purposes was far better suited to the job. And when we're talking about corruption, this is the other thing that I learned, Patrick, and I think this is really quite interesting, kind of adds a little bit to our discussion last time, and it's still very important here. On the corruption side of things, one of the things that the Han Dynasty was known for in terms of people achieving certain positions, and this is very different in many ways than how they went about it, say, in its contemporary with Rome on the other side of the European-Asian landmass which is that they implemented what are basically civil service exams. So that way, at least in their eyes at the time, they saw it as a form of genuine merit, that the people who are scoring well, passing, and excelling on those exams are also the people that are entrusted higher and more important elements of power. And Mm. they begin, of course, eroding that as well, and, or not following it nearly as well, and then just outward corruption, just ignoring it entirely. So this is really just one of the big, especially when you're talking about putting in these young, impressionable, easily to manipulate emperors on the throne, is possibly the greatest example of the corruption in detail here that we talked about last time and that has led the Han Dynasty to, w- to the point that we are currently following it and learning about it. Yeah, you couldn't put it better myself there, Paul. No, um, regents, as we saw, as they're sort of more, I guess, properly known as these people who tend to um, young rulers. We started this uh, podcast by talking about Wang Meng, and he basically rose to power thanks to being a regent to another young emperor. And yeah, it, it it's just such a reoccurring thing. It's something we even see in like modern popular cultures to this day. Um, we see regents abusing the power of young rulers. Anyway, speaking of abusing the power of young rulers, this uh, gives us a certain man by the name of Dong Zhao. And in uh, 189, as mentioned last time, uh, to help with the army defeating the Yellow Turban Rebellion, Emperor Ling gave regional armies their own power to do what they thought was best in that time. And This gave rise to various powerful generals, as we talked about that uh, as well. One of these being a man by the name of Dong Zhao. And General Dong Zhao played an important role in ending the rebellions. Zhao used his influence and all the chaos happening in the capital to remove the 13-year-old Zhao from the throne. And what he did is he replaced him with his even younger brother, uh, Jian. Uh, he thought, no, 13, that's too old. I need someone younger. So he made uh, the, the emperor's younger brother emperor. And he made himself this emperor's top regent. And on top of this, Dong Zhao poisoned the uh, former abdicating king. Just to add to the insult to injury. Not only did he make him uh, give up the throne, he then murdered him. And this effectively made Dong Zhao the ruler of China. And people weren't really happy with this. And due to his actions, 
other warlords grew angry with him saying, hey, that's not fair. Why is he getting to do this? Because he was clever enough to do it. And obviously these other warlords and people tried to overrun him. And to prevent this happening, Dong sacked his own capital to create a pang. He let his own capital burn to the ground to get ransacked just to escape. He used this panic to move the capital to another city called Xiang. And this city was chosen simply due to have better protection and defenses. You know, this guy's a real piece of work. It takes a very special kind of ambitious to go ahead and sack your own capital for your own benefit. It's not like he was sacking the capital because there was scorched earth tactics. He was doing it to create political chaos and also give him an opportunity to move the capital to another place entirely. That is insane. Quite clever, I guess, so. If you were to say any, <laughs> clever being a value-neutral descriptor in this case, <laughs> that's insane, man. But It's a bold move. Yes, and but it's an insanity. Bold, to be sure. But it's an insanity that seems to really be endemic in the crisis that you're covering right now. He's, it's not mm -hmm. even unique to him. No, no. And it was in this city that Dong Zhao gave himself the title of Grand Master of the Han Dynasty. Um, I believe this title had existed in the past, but hadn't been used in years. So he just said, yeah, that's me now. And this effectively makes that former younger brother of the emperor. He is the last emperor of the great Han Dynasty. It's, it's more or less officially over now. The Han Dynasty is basically gone. I mean, even though he, uh, Dong is calling himself the Grand Master of the Han Dynasty, what even is the Han Dynasty at this point? And he actually held on to this title from 189 AD till about 192 AD. And he was a brutal and cunning ruler. And you don't be a ruler like this without making some enemies. And Dong made a lot of enemies. And eventually his brutality turned his own men against him. And it was his own men who would betray him. And eventually he was assassinated at the hand of his own men in 193 AD. So Dong was about from a roughly 189 AD to 193 AD. That was the, the, it's just about four years or so. I mean, we, we could talk about what you can do in four years, Paul. I'm sure your country is very aware of what sort of stuff you can do in four years. But well, it's very yeah. impressive. <laughs> I just noticed that it's very impressive what... What a change to the nation he, he, he did in four years. What I find interesting is how he was actually deposed. Anytime you're in a position of power like that, Netflix is the crown recently, and, and some of their trailer promotions have this recreation of a possible example of this with the case of the depiction of Margaret Thatcher, where she talks about how she's comfortable about having enemies. And so yeah, you're always going to have enemies, but at the same time, you have to go the distance to make sure that those who are actually supporting you are benefiting from supporting you. The idea that his own army mutinied is truly a perfect example of when you are truly ruling through the means of outright raw fear. There has to be some reward for backing such a utterly ruthless individual that doesn't seem to have any anything that we would know as respect for no. for life he seems to have crossed that line to have mutiny now Edward, in AD history we've seen this happen a lot right especially yeah. in the roman empire the praetorian guard is effectively the the big mechanism of succession you know they have an issue they kill the guy and they do a whole lot behind the scenes to make sure they get someone they approve of in there as well but here, if your own troops are going up against you, that means that you did something wrong. And rule through sheer brutality is not enough. It was a really crazy time in China. This sort of 10-year period especially, it was just one disaster, I guess, to another it felt like. And while Dong wasn't the most liked person, he was keeping some form of order in the land. And his death actually plunged China into deeper deeper chaos and the Han Dynasty was well and truly over now by Han Dynasty thanks for the paper thanks for 
I don't know. What else did I have? Thanks for the wheelbarrow, I think. Thanks for that. <laughs> gun but powder. you're gone now. Thanks for gunpowder. Thanks Paper, for fireworks, but uh, you're over now. <laughs> firearms, gunpowder, all the good yeah. stuff. Everything all the that's good fun. stuff. That, that's over now. I guess this might be the first fall of an empire, at least a big empire, empire or dynasty, as they've been called here. We've witnessed here in AD history, I think, Paul. Am I correct in saying that? Absolutely. At least we, we, yeah. we noted, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is the first time that we are truly fully covering the collapse of a major political entity, to say the least, that made a tremendous contribution to world history and lasted for over 400 years. Mm. So we joined this story kind of in the middle. We, we, we literally, we started AD history in the middle of the Han Dynasty, or the end of the Western and started the Eastern, and it's, it's over now, which is sad. Well, sad. It, it, it's history. And yeah. anyway... With the Han Dynasty over and Dong's death in 193 AD, China was a mess for about three years. Emperors were just being puppets for various other tribes. Just If you look at a map of China in this period, it's just lots and lots of different small factions. It's definitely more than three, as a lot of people think we went straight into the three kingdoms. No, there's way more than three different clans or tribes or kingdoms at this period. And this chaos seemed to calm down in 196 AD. And by this time, the land was fragmented into various regions ruled by these aforementioned warlords who gained autonomy under the rule of Emperor Ling. Like I mentioned last time, Emperor Ling's decision to break rule and give, give these different uh, warlords their own rule and government, it kind of led to this period of Chinese history. That one little decision he made led to this and this also led to the return of Cao Cao who I think I called him Cao Cao last time whose apologies it's Cao Cao he was the poet warlord we talked about last time in our last episode who did a big role who played a large role in taking down the yellow turban revolt and he obviously as a warlord meant he had power now thanks to this rule Emperor Ling made like about 10 years ago now and he took over a huge area of what was northern Hun dynasty and what's amazing Cao Cao was even able to get the yellow turbans on his side by giving them land reform some of the stuff they wanted near the beginning despite squashing so many of them the yellow turban revolt was actually still going on at this time there's how much chaos China in that they weren't as pronounced but there was still some about and Cao Cao got them on their side so it is interesting that he manages to get the people that he defeated on side that's incredible that's an incredible achievement politically, to say the least. And so as far as the Yellow Turbans are concerned, a lot of, in, in addition to their greater concerns, things like the mandate of heaven and the clear corruption that's going on with Han officials that it goes all the way to the top, mm. one of the issues that they were having had a lot to do with how the Han Dynasty, especially coming into this period, dealt with land management issues. In particular, mm. when there was either a famine would occur or there's some sort of flooding, great storm, some kind of, especially when you're talking natural disasters. In the past, the way a lot of Han Dynasty rulers apparently managed this was that they would lower taxes on these farmers, many of them, or grain quotas, if you will, depending on how they did the exchange. To help, especially with the food situation, in addition to that, they would give certain breaks, uh, certain suspensions of being forbidden to hunt on royal land, imperial land. So that way, those who were starving or potentially would starve mm. could have some form of reasonable subsistence, which mattered a lot. But going into this period, when you're dealing with the various natural disasters that China's always had to manage, the Han court and emperor were, in fact, doing the opposite. They were raising taxes. They were not giving that kind of access to hunt on imperial or royal lands. And so to me, when I see Cao Cao bring the yellow turbans on side, and the biggest way he managed to do that had to do with enacting specific land reforms, it makes a lot of sense. And also, credit to Cao Cao. I mean, think about it. That's, a, that's an incredible 180 he managed to achieve there. And yeah. But you could also realistically, and this I don't think this is too much of a stretch, he was kind of buying them off 
He was kind of buying yeah. him off. He was definitely giving him the carrot, as you would expect. It just shows, like, uh, Sasa, we have this image of warlords being, like, these sort of big, I guess, somewhat dumb brutes. Like, you hear the word warlord, you don't think poetry or cunning or just intelligence in general, but Sasa was the complete package. He was a really clever guy to inform from the research i've done into him so far and he's he's going to carry on playing a big role well what i would say is that many warlords do have a significant intelligence but i wouldn't say that they were necessarily as well-rounded or classically refined as That's this warrior was to be sure which makes That's him special in a lot of ways i mean there are other great warriors that have a, what we consider to be kind of this classic lowercase liberal arts education <laughs> And that looks like what we're seeing with Sao Sao, which makes him a deeply compelling figure. He is a deeply compelling figure, and he's going to be playing um, a big role going forwards, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. And in 196 AD, he held the emperor under hostage and declared the land for himself. And this area in the north of the former Han Dynasty would eventually become Sao Wei. And Sao Wei is the northernmost kingdom of China's three kingdoms. However, I say almost there because this wouldn't be properly cemented until a few more decades down the line. So I think it's great just to look here at where exactly China was by the end of the second century AD. And like I mentioned, the popular way of looking into history, into China's history is by simply saying oh, the Han Dynasty came to an end and then we had the Three Kingdoms period. This was so far from the case because by and large, history doesn't work out as succinctly as that. And trust me, it'd be far easier for myself and Paul if it did. Oh, yeah. And there's, <laughs> there's usually a lot more going on. And that is exactly the case here. There were decades, literal decades, between the end of the Han Dynasty and the start of the proper Three Kingdoms, where the, na where the nation was just plunged into this chaos. It's not a smooth transition by any means. No, and I think we here, and this is a great place to end this season on because it reminds us of why we do AD history in the way we do. At least I think so, Paul. Like, oh, God, yeah. we, put, we put so much stock into looking into the deep nitty gritty of some scenarios like this and looking decade by decade. And if we weren't looking in to history on a decade by decade basis like we are, we probably wouldn't have mentioned this this it period in as much detail. We probably would have just said, ah, then things got crazy for a little bit. And then we got the three kingdoms. But thanks to how we do things here at AD History, it allows us to look into history other people aren't really looking at as much. It's it's really true. So one of the benefits, of course, of this show is is the detail. The idea that you could be taking 2,000 years, decade by decade, allows us to create various, what I would call, micro narratives or to be more specific these threads that create the tapestry that no one of them in and of themselves is the story but they add to the greater story that ultimately becomes our hd world and of course that story cannot be complete by any stretch of the imagination there would be a big freaking gaping hole in it without china and seeing these kind of micro narratives come together in the way that we have and being able to give them the attention they deserve is truly what I love about doing AD history. It paints such a detailed picture, especially when you listen to it in its anthology form. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah, that's couldn't put it better myself, Paul. This is why we're doing this to look at things like this. And Paul, I believe you have some questions for me. and I'm going to answer those as best as I can. So. Here's the thing that I really wonder anytime you have this grand chaos, especially when we're well outside of the modern era where you can't theoretically have a reporter stick a camera and a microphone in someone's face and ask a bunch of people. For those that were just your average subject on the street, as it were, I'm curious how many of them really wanted this? How many of them actually desired change, not just to this extent, but in this way? I have so much trouble believing that if you're just making your way, living your life, and you have these incredible events happening around you, and I suppose this is the human experience, if it is anything, mm -hmm. did they actually want this? I don't have a clear answer for you, Paul, because unfortunately, in this time of history, the common person, the average member of the public, doesn't really get a say. And I would love to know, that's for sure. Um, 
what comes to mind for me with this, and it's something we've talked about in the past, is Game of Thrones. Despite the dragons and the zombies of so kind of ice zombies, Game of Thrones like is really accurate to how things actually happened in history. And what's so wonderful about Game of Thrones is how little the the the, the general public play a role in that show. Like if you actually think about it, especially in those early seasons, like the normal people don't give a shit about what's going on with these kings and queens vying for power. And it's it's just a great example of that. And in the past, the public opinion wasn't always paramount. And I've just it just it just reminded me of Game of Thrones there, as so much of history does. Yeah. Anytime you have these kind of very powerful central authorities, certainly in the short term, the public opinion and so far as it counts for anything, is not always so much part of the calculation, though it can't be completely discounted because we have seen it so many times with people in one form or another rising up and saying, enough, 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 you've screwed things up, we're no longer going to tolerate this crap. And for the most part, you know, if you're not this this great, powerful person that is somehow within the great structure of power and whatever political entity it is, you're pretty much just going along for the ride. Exactly. Yeah, that's the best way to put it, going along for the ride. And something I'm going to ask myself and as in general is, I wonder what the mandate of heaven was doing at this time. I wonder what the public opinion was. I wonder I wonder where they thought the mandate of heaven lied during all of this. I thought that That's something I'd love to know. As you described it in our previous episode, I love the way you put it. It is such a malleable concept. It really is, yeah. It can be used in any way you can possibly imagine to achieve the aims that you your ambition is driving for. How can you define an agreement between a, a ruling body and a supernatural entity? How are they interpreting the will of that supernatural entity or entities? It's impossible to follow, at least from our perspective, because we're generally, especially in modernity, one of the difficulties of doing history like this is not reading into our own biases in terms of looking at this sort of thing and, and you know, basically operating in largely, especially in the Western tradition, in very secular governments. Hasn't always been that way. I mean, even in your case, in, in Great Britain, a very secular culture, for the most part, a very secular government, but still very much operates under a symbolic monarchy, a constitutional monarchy, even though I know Great Britain doesn't have a formal constitution, it's a series of conventions that have built up over time. But Elizabeth II is still the head of the Church of England, in addition to being the head of state. To me, interpreting the, the will of any supernatural entity, especially when you are doing it to achieve or justify some political aim, is something that in the present that I think is really important to recognize that's a very difficult concept to reconcile from our modern perspective. And that can't be any more true than the mandate of heaven. Yeah, it's such a fascinating concept and idea. And like I said, malleable. It's just it's just something interesting to think about that there was this thing floating around, I guess, at the time, this mandate of heaven. I just loved I would love to have known where they thought it was. Like, did they really think it was with those emperors who were just sort of basically puppet martyrs? Did they think someone like Sao Sao had the mandate of heaven? I guess we won't know. <laughs> we most certainly don't know, and I don't know necessarily how, but I'd be very curious if there were. And certainly, if you're listening to us wherever you are listening to us, or if you're on YouTube, leave a comment, because this is we really do want to further inform this. Believe me, this is something we want to know, and mm. if you know it, share it, please, by all means. The next question I'm kind of curious about is, and we saw a little bit of it in our previous episode, but how did all of this chaos, especially now with China being very inwardly focused, how did it affect their relationship with the outside world and neighboring powers? Simply put, I'm not too sure. Um, I didn't really report anything. Obviously, you, you're talking about Japan and its relationship. Nothing came up outright. I don't know if Rome knew this was going on in China at the time. I'm not too sure on that matter. But I imagine it probably did affect things because China did trade with Rome. They traded with a lot of places. And I guess like with all this chaos going on, could there still be trade patterns going out, trade routes? Who was organizing all of this? In the midst of this chaos, I wonder. I don't. I, I imagine not many people. So maybe it did affect like other empires getting goods from China. 
Well, one thing I can definitely say about the territory that Cao Cao ended up consolidating is from a trade and economic perspective, a lot of that is in very close, if not including proximity to these well-established Silk Road highways, especially when you're talking about the northern route through the Tarim Basin, very advantageous. Also, we, we saw some combat and some military skirmishes where the Korean kingdoms are trying to take advantage of this situation. And then, of course, you have what's happening in Vietnam, where they're essentially getting the opportunity to break off as well, which is something I think we'll cover at another time because it's really quite mm -hmm. interesting. My next question to you is kind of a big picture question, Patrick. And what I want to know is, what were the critical, in your opinion, long-term factors that made the Han Dynasty basically head in the direction of this mass schism? Was this something that was long time in the works brewing? And because one of our ground rules here is that nothing in history is inevitable, is there anything reasonably that they could have done to right the ship that would have allowed them to forestall this chaos before it even began? I guess just don't be corrupt. Is too simple of an answer, <laughs> but that's what it all. This 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 downfall for the Han Dynasty was a long term, long time coming, um, and it just seems that as they got bigger and more powerful, you had the eunuchs who were in the background working their way. People, you basically, I guess, become the big. The bigger your empire gets, the bigger target you get, not only for outside empires, but for people inside the empire to attack it. And Han Dynasty just got big and powerful and a lot of people wanted to control that power and that just led to it destruction from the inside you know that this isn't an outside empire it's not like rome came and destroyed the Han dynasty the Han dynasty destroyed itself and i imagine this probably was avoidable if things were done better if they stuck to a tradition if they didn't get greedy and give people positions who paid for them i imagine things could have gone better and it, this wouldn't have been inevitable we said nothing in history is inevitable so I imagine if they just weren't as greedy or didn't want to get as corrupt as much, then things would have been better for longer. But would we have would, you, would we have the Han Dynasty to this day? You know, that that's not a question I'm willing to answer. Something that I am going to be curious about that we'll delve into in future sections is I'm curious in time how much these changes actually improved these situations or if it actually, in fact, made it worse. But the last one I'm going to leave you here with, Patrick, is another one of those big questions, one of those high concept questions as far as I'm concerned, and at least in your eyes, what is the legacy that the Han Empire left for global posterity? If people think of ancient China, if people think, oh yes, China, I've got to, if you close your eyes and think, what did China look like in the past? You have the Han Empire, the Han Dynasty, that they created basically the modern, I guess to a lot of people, like they created what we know of China to this day. Like we talked about the inventions of the Han Dynasty, things that came from there, that they left a huge, huge legacy that you can name it. Most sort of quintessentially Chinese things came about during this period. That's the kind of legacy I think they left, just a strong cultural image for China that they still hold on to. There's really no question about it. It's amazing how China has absorbed all of these elements over thousands of years that form one of the most formidable and awesome historical legacies that humanity possesses. And it's awe-inspiring. It really is. It's very humbling. Because here in the West, our our history in this kind of way is not doesn't go back nearly as far in the same way. And it's really not until we pick it up, for the most part, in our show where we begin seeing it operate in that way. It didn't start exclusively in the beginning of the AD epoch, but when you mm. compare it to places like East Asia, where the timescales, or, or Southern Asia, or the Middle East, the timescales get so, so much longer. It's, it's hard to comprehend with our monkey brains. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything else for us, Mr. Foot? I want to say thank you, Han Empire, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for the journey, and you're the first character to get killed off in the series, it seems. You're the first big death. Yes, indeed. Thank you for all you've done, all we've learned, and always thank you for the fish. <laughs>
One last thing I will say is if they ever if they ever make AD history into a uh, HBO series, the Han Dynasty is being played by Sean Bean. <laughs> of that, you and I <laughs> are in absolute and total agreement. And with that, we'll be back right after a word from Anna Domini. This is the AD History Podcast. Keep up with the show and join the discussion by following AD History on Twitter with the handle at AD History PC and the hashtag AD History. Check us out over on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube by searching AD History Podcast, as well as, of course, tgnreview.com slash AD History Podcast. Also, check out the AD History Podcast on Patreon. See how you can help support the show and the rewards that await you by exploring the AD History podcast on Patreon. See the link in the description. Now, back to Paul and Patrick. So, Paul, our uh, adventures in East Asia haven't come to an end quite yet because, as you mentioned at the top of this episode, we are finally going to one of my personal favourite countries, a country I hold near and dear to my heart. I've had the pleasure of visiting a couple times now and I cannot wait to go again once once we can travel again. I cannot wait to go visit Japan once again. And you've got a very interesting segment of Japanese history with us Paul, for us today, Paul, to wrap up this second century of AD. So, Paul, please tell us about Queen Himiko. So, Patrick, I think it is best to set the scene. In the late second century AD, according to the Chinese Book of Wei, there was a queen that was also referred to as a shamaness in Japan by the name of Himiko, and she ruled over 30 kingdoms, and that she was a very successful ruler, and a ruler who we will try to learn more about. But in terms of her historical confirmation and concurring sources, we have a incredible historical puzzle. When we start talking about history, there are many times when historians are faced with these historical jigsaw puzzles where there are a lot of disparate sources where you're trying to validate the account of one and reconcile it with another, and how we interpret that information, which is largely known as histography. And in the case of Queen Himiko, she most certainly is that. So this is by far one of the most hotly debated elements of Japanese history for Japanese historians today. As far as our understanding of Himiko goes, or the situation in which she ruled, we have essentially three sources that are particularly relevant here. One is the Book of Wei, which comes from the Wei Kingdom in China that was written several decades after this particular decade in question. And then you have two other incredibly important books that were written about 500 years later. First one in this case, being the Kojiki in 712 AD and the Nihon Shoki in 720. Once again, we ask ourselves the question, what do we know of Himiko, or, depending on your preference, Pimiko? She really is the first significant person noted in Japanese history as a major political figure, as a ruler. And she apparently ruled during what is known as the Yoyoi, period in Japan, which goes from about 1000 BC to 300 AD in a capital called Yamatai, or depending on your preference, Yamatai Kaku. As I mentioned, she was apparently the queen of 30 municipalities, and she was described as a shamaness. Apparently, she came to power, according to the Book of Wei, after a great but poorly defined conflict which lasted the better part of a century. When we go back, apparently, according to Chinese sources, the earlier Chinese source we're using to get more context for this person and time and place she ruled was the, we had mentioned before, the aforementioned Book of Han, which mentions there being 
100 such communities in Japan. But if you take it from the Book of Way where it picks up later, and I think it's important to note here that when it comes to dynasties in this case, especially in regards to China, they all seem to turn out these official histories of a particular political rule, kind of a way to intellectually formalize and cement their greater soft power, what we would call today. So cultural, intellectual, as opposed to at the end of a sword or economic strong handing, that kind of thing. You get the idea. It was a way to increase their own image and polish it off. Mm. Mm. And that's really important to note. Apparently, she gained power by largely spellbinding the 30 communities that were left. As far as that's concerned, after successfully ending the conflict and achieving power over those 30 municipalities, she retired to a somewhat secluded citadel, kind of a castle palace type thing, something you'd expect someone of that lineage and power to live in. And apparently she was attended by a thousand women and exactly one man who was more or less <laughs> fulfilling the role of a butler. And he was also a messenger that served at Himiko's pleasure. <laughs> and in her place, handling all of the outward political matters, she basically appointed her brother to ultimately do this. But there was no question who held the real power here. He was the face, but she was the brain, and she was fully in charge. The Chinese knew of Himiko because like lesser known rulers prior to her in terms of their relationship to the Han Dynasty, and there definitely is ongoing relationships between political powers in Japan and the major powers that are in play in mainland China at this time, which is incredible when you think about it. One of the reasons we know about her is because she actually sent tribute to the Chinese Wei Kingdom, which they graciously accepted. And Himiko received a gold seal from the Wei Kingdom, anointing her a friend of the Chinese people. So we're looking at it as a, in many respects, as a, as a very traditional tributary relationship, cozying up with a bigger power. Do you think there's really much to gain through this pool, uh, cozying up with a Chinese power if you're ruling Japan, especially at this time period? Imagine if, if uh, Himiko and Japan were friendly with China at the time, they must have known Things weren't going all too great for China at this time. This is true. What I would say is that I would imagine there's some symbolic power to knowing that you have this great Chinese dynasty that has your back. So you're scratching China's back, in the case of the Han or the Wei, and they're scratching yours. In a more practical way, the answer is also yes, but not necessarily in a timely manner which I will get to in a moment here because it very much coalesces with the story that we are learning here. But given the practical distance to some extent, yeah, could they give military aid or, or you know, rally to your flag? Sure, you know, just don't set your watch to it. It's not easy crossing, especially in that time, the, the Yellow Sea or the Sea of Japan. I mean, look, look what happened in the Mongols when they tried to invade. And the, the aforementioned kamikaze, the divine wind that ultimately allowed them to fail and never really reach Japan. So in a practical sense, yes, with a caveat, which is you better have the ability to wait because it's going to take time to get there, time to rally the forces, and then time and hopefully to successfully get them back. There's a lot that needs to go right for that to happen. So yes, but I think a lot of it's symbolic. China has such a tremendous influence on Japan for such a long time. You can see it today by all means. It's fantastic. It, it, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to study. Now, the question then becomes, as we were mentioning a little bit earlier, how do we know this? As far as practical effects, she did, towards the end of her rule, call on the Kingdom of Wei to give her military support. We don't have great detail about the nature of her conflict. What we do know is that but by the time the Wei forces managed to land where they needed to be, 
she was already dead, and they mm-hmm. had constructed a monument to her. A bit late. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the Calvary was just far, far too late to make a difference. <laughs> so it's a good question, and a realistic one, because mm. you look at it, you look at the time scale, look where they are. <sighs> it doesn't work out well, but they did it all the same. The question now becomes, how do we know this of Himiko? Well, here's the rub. We clearly have contradictory sources. The Chinese Book of Wei and the earlier Chinese Book of Han is essentially all of the information in terms of histories that were taken down of the information provided about Himiko. The Japanese sources do not mention her at all all huh Hmm. interesting is it not you think if anyone's going to be talking about their uh ruler it's the nation who 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 they rule over so you would think but there's always certain ingredients that lead to such a situation now let's take a look at the japanese sources understand them a bit better and then Hmm. we'll kind of round it out back again to where himiko comes into the situation Hmm. So in terms of our classical understanding of classical Japanese history, there are two major texts that we need to know about and we need to discuss. The first one is the aforementioned Kojiki, and the other is the aforementioned Nihon Shoki. In the case of the Kojiki, which translates roughly into English as an account of ancient matters, quite fitting, was written around 712 AD and focused heavily on the ancestral and ancient histories of japan it fleshes out certain now well-established pathologies the origins of the japanese home islands and some actual history is the first such major document that tells in formalized fashion of the famous creation myth that you may have heard of at some point in time i'm not going to go into terrible detail to you in the moment (laughs) it's not entirely relevant here but if you're familiar with dipping the bejeweled sword into the ocean, I think you're following along pretty well at this point. And it's viewed that some of the writings were an attempt to lay an official history that validated the Imperial Yamato family and dynasty that has been the ruling emperor's family ever since. They're often called the the longest continuous imperial family It's certainly in the epoch that we're talking about, Patrick. And it is really quite impressive because the newest Japanese emperor, albeit one that no longer has the divine mandate, is still in power. They're still there. Yeah. Every a lot of things changed with that institution, but the family and lineage most certainly did not. No, no. It worked in, like I said, they're still in power today. The next one actually came out eight years later in 720. It's called the Nihon Shoki which is translated into English as the Chronicles of Japan. And it was written under the supervision of Prince Toneri and O no Yasu Maru. And it was dedicated to Emperor Gensho. And it was written in classical Chinese, which is interesting here, guys, because we're looking centuries later, we were talking about that Chinese influence on Japan. And official documents in that period were written in classical Chinese. So I think that's rather interesting if we're looking for examples, really concrete ones, especially relative to what we're doing here, that show that aforementioned influence, Hmm. which is great, which is interesting, which is extremely illuminating. This book basically informs a ton of our understanding about whether it's classical Japanese history. It retreads the mythical creation myth, as was the case in the Kojiki And it largely focuses on the history from the 8th century onwards. Both of the aforementioned texts are meant to generally complement each other. For all that matters, neither of these highly important sources speak of Himiko at all. Nothing. (laughs) Nada. Nor does it mention the 100 municipalities that were in existence prior to the conflict that led to Himiko's ride to power, and nor the 30 remaining municipalities she ruled over that are mentioned in the Book of Way. And there is absolutely no modern consensus on the location, or depending on who you're talking to, even its existence, of her famous capital, Yamatai. 
none of this was really that huge of a surprise. So, no, it's not a surprise at all. It sounds a bit like an Atlantis sort of scenario going on here of Yamatai. Ooh, I think there are some people who might agree with that. But generally, if we're looking at it from the historian's point of view at this point in time, though there is no yet definitive proof, at least from an archaeological standpoint, yet as far as I understand, I could be wrong, they think Yamatai was located on Kyushu. You know how Japan, the archipelago of Japan, kind of makes this wide J-type shape? Yes, yeah, so banana-shaped. <laughs> exactly. So if you're, if you're looking at a map of Kyushu, it's kind of in the north and western portion, as I understand it. That's where they think it is. I don't know that it's as extreme a situation where we're talking about it in the way that we are with Atlantis, where for the most part we're only operating on what could have very easily just been a metaphor of Plato. We're talking about actual histories here that intended to mm. be as such. But of course, they weren't Japanese history. But in the case of her not being mentioned, this is not a terrible surprise because of how these documents, the, the Kojiki and the Nihon Shojiki, were created because they had a political purpose to it. They were taking mythology and legend and some histories and bringing in certain groups of people, certainly excluding others, all for a specific purpose. In addition to the fact that they may very well not have known. And when you start getting into the mythical side of things and, and the early emperors, it becomes difficult to even definitively establish that many of them existed at all. That's part of this grand historical puzzle. In regards to the Book of Way, what is our opinion on that as modern historians? Um, do we see that as more a more definitive history or is that seen as being sort of a mythology based book as well? Because... They say if these two are primarily based in myths and sort of retelling things that had a political point, whereas the Book of Way is a more historically accurate one, it's more likely that we should, I guess, take the stock of the historical book, more importantly, I suppose. Well, there's no question that, as I mentioned earlier, that the Book of Way does serve a certain political purpose because these dynasties mm. are all creating these official histories. I think one of the reasons why historians are more inclined to the veracity of the claims that are made in the Book of Way in this case is, for one, for the most part, in a grander sense. First off, they were there at the time. They had interactions. They had official political interactions with Japan at the time, which is important. That's something that I, I cannot be sure that those who are reading the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki would necessarily have had access to. In addition, that they didn't really have a, a serious horse in the race. You don't have a serious horse in the race. You're going off of what is a far more contemporaneous history, but mind you all, this is still being written about 100 years later. That's when yeah. we get in the book of ways, it's late, late in, the, in the third century, but a heck of a lot sooner than the other two. And even though they did have political interest in Japan because they had tributary relationships with these powers, they did not have some greater idea in mind about Japanese identity and nationhood in a way that we would more think of it in that way, or that somebody who was writing the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki would several centuries later. That and also kind of corroborates and flows from the book of Han, which mentions the hundred communities that by the Book of Way is down to 30 communities. So there is something of an attractive flow and connection between the two. It's never perfect, I grant you, but it was far more contemporaneous. They're dealing with these people that they actually dealt with and they're taking down, they don't have a horse in the race. But one thing that is certainly undeniable is that we're dealing with something that is very contentious, very, very... Mm -hmm controversial. Mm -hmm. So here's generally how many Japanese historians try to handle this thing as far as Himiko in regards to the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki. Basically what they do is this. They take her life and rule and they believe some of them, the possibility is that she may be Empress Jengu, who ruling very roughly in the same general period of time as Himiko did. You have Yamaho Toti Omomoso Mamiko. She was a shaman aunt of Empress Suji. Then, of course, you also have Yamato Himai Nomikoto, who's the daughter of Empress Suni 
and founder of the Issei Shrine. And the fourth possibility, of course, was that she was a true historical figure that lived, ruled, and inspired the all-important Amaterasu. And who is Amaterasu exactly? Amaterasu, for all intents and purposes, especially from a political standpoint in Japan, is by far one of the most important gods or spirits going back a very long way. She's the sun goddess. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the way this works and the way the Yamato family has very much established its rule over an extended period of time is the way the story goes is that, and this is before, of course, abdicating the divine mandate Emperor Hirohito had to do at the end of the Second World War. But the idea mm. was that the emperor, whoever they were, were a living direct descendant of the sun goddess Amaterasu, and they sat on the chrysanthemum throne. Yes. And it's believed that it's entirely possible that Himiko may have been the all-important originator of the whole idea behind Amaterasu and her importance in establishing credible, authoritative rule and justifying such a dynasty due to that divine connection. And as far as the whole imperial system is concerned, Patrick, as you know, it goes through many different iterations over time. Like when, if you're going through, for example, Tokugawa shogunate period, you look at the Tokugawa shogunate period, there's mm -hmm. an emperor there, but the emperor is an absolute figurehead and it's the shogun who's mm -hmm. calling the shots, basically holding them hostage and politically, certainly, and they did it for mm -hmm. a very, very long time. And of course, you then later, you know, you're in the 1860s, you have the Meiji Restoration when the emperor becomes the guy again, but they managed to create it. And so much of this is based on the idea that they were a divine being, that even if you are going to rule Japan by default, you still needed that sort of authority that was given to you by that divine imprimatur. Interesting stuff. Something I'm finding interesting with all this is regardless or not Himiko is a, a real figure or not and uh, clearly she is thought to be believed to be based on this uh, series of women and of course this all-important Amaterasu is a female god as well. It's incredible to see what an important role um, women played in this early Japanese history. I think that's really important to note here. How many female rulers or just important females have we talked about so far in Haiti history in general, Paul? <laughs> countless. It's absolutely countless. I think obviously one of the the most notable, yeah. the most one of the most memorable, of course, is Boudica or Boudicca, if you will. She still rings true in your nation today. Exactly. Yeah. It's just great to see like that happening here, like in Rome, like, especially like in Rome. They don't really put much uh, priority in women. So it's just cool to see it here. It's just uh, something worth noting out. It is, and that's one of the things that make this complicated, especially over time, because the way a lot of East Asian cultures, in this case, we're looking at Japan specifically, and this is certainly true easily over the last uh, several centuries, is that women in Japan were well noted and well established to be subordinate to the needs and wants mm. and and existence of men. That's something that has endured. Obviously, that's changed a good deal. You know, events over the last century have changed that dynamic quite a bit, but not completely, to be sure. It's certainly very different than what we experience in the West, but all the same, it certainly has changed. The fact that you are deriving power from a goddess, a female sun god, is really incredible. And I am generally curious, even if they did believe that Himuko existed at the time that the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki were created, that even if they did know about it and they did believe it was true, would they have chosen to alter the text not to reflect that kind of incredible influence going back to Himiko? That's almost impossible to know. To be sure, that's speculation. That's definitely mm -hmm. us in the present looking at it through the lens of the present and modern Western interpretations of how we view the roles of men and women. But mm. it's certainly something that we have to consider here. Something I want to know is what exactly did China think of Japan? Well, Mr. Name explained, I think you'll find this particularly interesting and more interesting than most. <laughs> in the case of China's relationship to Japan in this period, 
we first start getting serious word about them from the Book of Han, where they talk about a, a rocky island that sits out in the ocean. And they refer to these people by the name of Wa, which is one of the earliest recorded names for Japan, though interestingly enough, not from the Japanese themselves. And the way the Chinese characters work out is it translates into English basically as dwarf, which is highly pejorative. I think it's pretty clear in this case, to be sure. Yeah, and I think, uh, forgive me, it's been a while, it's one of the earliest videos I made talking about Japan's name. I think it can also be translated to meaning submissive, which of course hasn't got the best connotations to us either. They basically looked at them, well, they looked down on them. Who are we kidding, right? Basically, yeah, yeah. they looked at them as kind of like backwards barbarians that required the, the rearing of the great Chinese civilization to truly become civilized. <laughs> and when have we run into that before in AD history? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's just, it's funny how this works out. Things just repeat themselves. Like these concepts just crop up over and over. Yeah. And, and in a piece of interesting historical reconstruction, I would say, some Japanese figures and historians have taken out that character for Wa and replaced it with a kanji that was peace and love and yes, things of that yeah. nature. Saving face, which I gotta be honest <laughs> with you, I don't exactly blame them. No, yeah, it's not it's not the best connotation. Who would who would want to accept that? No, not so, many people. So basically this also ties into your, your question about why is it that the Chinese sources are more authoritative. Well, like I said, you know, they didn't really think highly of these people. They didn't clearly didn't have a race in it. And for the most part, though, we cannot be sure. There's no reason that they would have had to not reveal and mention Himiko's reign. But what is certain is this, is there is so much around her existence that's deeply controversial. I think not too long ago, they believe they may have actually unearthed her tomb and excavated. Wow. I think it was on some kind of imperial property. But for whatever reason, and I don't fully understand why, and I'll definitely do more research on the subject, and if you listening to us, wherever you may be, know, feel free to email us or leave comments on YouTube if you are listening or watching on there. But they, they put the kibosh on it. And I'm not 100% sure why they chose to do so. So it would only be speculation on my part, and I do not want to speculate here. But they didn't have a high opinion of them, but they didn't have a horse in the race, and they were also dealing with them. So you're, you're seeing this very early relationship between these two powers, which is a relationship that's going to dictate over an extended period of time, and certainly our show, so many of the dynamics and events that really are incredibly important and dictate East Asian history during our period as a whole. Of course, you can't discount Korea. You can't discount the various kingdoms that are now what we call Southeast Asia or what is about to happen in a big way in the Indian subcontinent or the mm. cushions which are coming to their own end at this point in time. But so much of the drink is stirred either from China or Japan and they're going to give and take from each other, to be sure. Culturally, the Japanese are going to take a lot from China, without yeah. a doubt. And that's going to be fun. That's going to be yeah. really fun to see. That's largely where historians sit. So did she exist? I think there is a reasonable possibility she did. There are certain elements of how the history is told in the Book of Wei that seem to, to ring true based on current historical methods. But the truth of the matter is it's still an open debate and that it's controversial for a good many reasons in Japan. <laughs> and I don't know how close we are to truly establishing it because we don't know a heck of a lot. We're being shown this puzzle and we have to really fill in the gaps using our intellect and whatever evidence we have as much as possible. And more than anything, in addition to the fact this is an incredibly interesting element <laughs> of Japanese history, which I had been so eager to eventually sink our teeth into, mm. much like we were dealing with in, in earlier episodes with various figures, we don't have the whole picture. And so what do you do when you don't have the whole picture? We just speculate. <laughs> to some degree, I wouldn't even necessarily call it speculate so much as it's historical extrapolation, which of course could just be a euphemism depending on how cynical you are listening to this right now. 
but that's precisely why I chose it here today, Patrick. I just did a little bit of Googling as you were discussing this, and I just found out, uh, so Empress Himiko is the main villain, or kind of the main villain, in one of my favorite video games. So that's fun oh, that, to find that's out. That's right. There's a Is there a Tomb Raider element? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, that's so, right. I forgot all about that Tomb Raider. Goodness. Yeah, so um, the new the new series of Tomb Raider, the um, reboot series, the first one of those, the 2013 Just Called Tomb Raider game, is set in Japan. And it's all about uh, Empress Himiko and her lost city. And I was just sort of like, oh, gosh. when you It was when you mentioned her tomb. I wrote Himiko Tomb to see if any articles came up. And of course, uh, Google suggested Himiko Tomb Raider, and then the penny dropped. I was like, "Oh yeah, so I'm I'm quite aware of Himiko because that's one of my favorite video games." So, if you want any homework or to understand this better, go play that game. It's great. Yeah, yeah, play it up, play it up, play it up. <laughs> Considering your AD history homework, by all means, exactly. Yes, I can't believe I missed that. You were never going to miss that. But no, um, no, I need just by sheer luck of googling, I saw that. I've always had an appreciation for the the Laura Croft story and a character, though yeah. I never really got into Tomb Raider as a kid. Uh, me neither. I remember my older brother, like I, I, I'm, my oldest brother was like prime PS1 age. So um, I have many early memories of watching him play the original Tomb Raiders, but this is getting, again, a little yeah, bit off topic, yeah, but it's just topic. what That's came it. to mind for me. But it's a great way to end the, end up this decade, I suppose. I'm a bit of a fun chat and, Paul, we're going to be having a fun chat in the next episode of AD History because it's not going to be our normal. We're not we're not diving straight into 201. The third century can wait a moment because we've got uh, something special coming up in the next episode, which if you've been listening to a while now, you'll know what the next episode is going to be about. The vaunted, necessary, <laughs> awesome, and altogether amazing what we missed. AD History, the second century. And I oh, I love doing those. I mm, love doing those. The last you, one. We've only done one so far, but it was really good fun. Oh, it, it was because the reality is, and if you've been listening to us for a while now, you know we can't cover everything we want to cover or everything that could reasonably cover because we have to make tough editorial choices. But <laughs> when it comes to what we missed, that's just a whole lot of fun all at once. That's mm. a good time. It's fun to listen to. And of course, we love hearing your thoughts on what we missed when we get to that episode. And we always want you to share those thoughts with us. And as we wrap here now, Patrick, one thing is certain is that we are two seasons in the books for AD history. I can't believe mm -hmm. we are here talking about that right now, but here we are. And all I can say at the end of it is that it's been an amazing journey so far. But most importantly, the thing that has made it truly amazing has been you, the listener, and what you have done, not simply by listening, but contributing, reaching out, asking questions, letting us know your thoughts, and joining us on this epic journey, as I can think of no better word to describe the nature of AD history. Thank you guys so much for listening so far. And it's only going to get bigger from here. The world is only going to expand more and more. We've already covered 200 years of history with a fine toothed comb. And we're going to carry on this tapestry. We're going to make this into something spectacular. And we're really picking up steam now. Thank you all so much for listening, for leaving reviews, for just having comments. You guys make AD history possible in that way. We wouldn't be telling this story if it weren't for you guys are listening so if you're happy to listen we're happy to speak by all means and we'll be back right after a word from ad this is the ad history podcast well that does it for us today patrick where can people find us you can find me personally primarily on Instagram at NameExplainYT. But you can also find me on Twitter at NameExplainYT. And of course, on YouTube, search NameExplain. What about you, Paul? In addition to my usual work at TGNR at TGNReview.com, you can find me at my Twitter handle at PKD in History, as well as my reader submitted World War II QA column, The World War II Brain Bucket, where I answer all World War II related questions, which, if you are on YouTube, we will have a link down in the description. That's all today for myself. Goodbye, thank you, and take care. Yes, thank you all so much. Until next time. Like all good things, we come to an end for today. 
Thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. It is listeners such as yourself who make this show possible and truly awesome. Be sure to follow and subscribe for upcoming AD History Podcast episodes, available wherever podcasts are found. Also, follow AD History on social media. Follow the show on Twitter at the handle at ADHistoryPC, as well as on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash ADHistoryPodcast and Instagram as ADHistoryPodcast. In addition to liking and subscribing on YouTube by searching AD History Podcast. Do you have a direct comment or question for Paul and Patrick? Drop them an email at adhistorypodcast at tgnreview.com. Also, be sure to visit the show's homepage at tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. For Paul and Patrick, thank you for listening to the AD History. We'll see you again next time in the ever-growing tapestry of world history.